Um, hello, everyone, and welcome. This is our first um, learning lunch um, here at the Royal Canadian Regiment Museum. This is a new online program that we're trying out um, for the first time today. So it's really exciting that you're able to join us here. Um, my name is Sarah Coates. I'm the public programmer here at the Royal Canadian Regiment Museum. And with me is Jessica Stevenson, who is the collections registrar. Um, we both work here at the Royal Canadian Regiment Museum in London, Ontario, where we look at the history of Canada's oldest permanent force infantry unit, um, the Royal Canadian Regiment. So we're going to go over some administrative stuff, and then we are going to jump into this conversation. Um, just so that um, for those who are joining us now are aware, uh, we are recording this presentation. Um, we are not going to be turning on anybody's cameras or microphones as a result. So if you have any um, questions, please, we really encourage you to put them into the chat. Uh, Jessica will be the one taking care of the chat and helping share questions as we go through. Um, so if you have any questions, you can put them either directly to her or to everyone in the chat. Um, and if you have any technical issues as well, please direct them to Jessica and we will do what we can to help you with that. Uh, what we're going to be looking at today is what uh, we are as museum staff looking at when we're looking at the insides of military uniforms. Um, we talk a lot about all the time about stuff that's on the outside, the badges, like how they're, they're designed and how there's different insignias on them. Um, but today we're actually going to be looking at what's on the inside. Um, and this is something that I am very, very excited about. Um, as I mentioned, I am the public programmer, but I do help with the textiles at the museum. So this is something that I'm very passionate about and I have a lot of enthusiasm for, which you're probably gonna, probably gonna notice. Um, so we're gonna talk about a whole bunch of things um, ranging from tags and labeling to signs of wear to construction. So these are some of the topics that we're gonna be looking at. And just to clarify before we get started about what my lovely background is, um, this is actually um, magnification on a wool, a wool uniform. So we're gonna, I'm gonna talk about this specific wool later on, but yes, this is wool fibers under magnification. I forget exactly what time is magnification at this exact moment, because I have saved this picture on Zoom, um, but it's behind me. So we will talk about more of that when we get started. So I'm gonna get the slideshow up. Just bear with me for one moment. Okay, this one. Alrighty, can everybody see the slideshow? Good, awesome. Yep. Brilliant. All right, so if you have any questions as we go through, I will, uh, Jessica will try and feed them to me as we go, but if we miss any, we'll try and get to them uh, when we get to the end of the presentation. Okie doke. So the first thing I wanna to talk to you guys about is those labels and that tagging, because as I said, I am very enthusiastic about it and I find it really, really helpful, and it's a really useful part um, of when we look inside a, a textile. So these are battle dress trousers served from 1953. When I begin the process of describing a textile piece, particularly Second World War onward, I'm usually looking for this type of information to be somewhere inside, either stamped on like this one or attached as a tag. When they're present, it's a really, really useful starting point to understand about the item. Like looking at these trousers, because of the way the pockets were, I would usually, I would set them as a post Second World War pair of trousers. But when there's a, num a date right there on it, man, that simplifies my life. <laughs> because it's, it's a clear, it's a clear and specific date. Because as Jessica, you're probably very aware, a lot of things get described in pattern years. And those patterns yes. are used for a really long time. So to actually know specifically is. Yes something that I find very, very helpful. Sarah, we have a question. Okay. Um, will you be explaining the difference in BEF and CEF men's uniforms today? I will not be going into the specific details on that, but remind me once we get to the end, because I think I might have a source that would be useful for someone um, All right. on that. But remind me at the end, because I think I might have something that'd be helpful. Um, yeah. Um, about the these ones though, so as I was saying, they provide this really useful information because it clearly says, I don't know if you can see my mouse, battle dress, trousers, surge, sizing, manufacturing company, though it's a little bit hard to read, and a date. But then we have this red R. And I currently have not figured out what that red R means. So 
And the same moment that they're giving me more information, they're raising new questions, which research is ongoing and we might be able to find the answer to, but at this moment, I'm, it's actually brought up a new question, which is quite, quite interesting. So this is a 1953 example. So now I'm gonna to jump to a later version. So this is from 1988 as the label nicely shows you, but Jessica, looking at this, noticing some differences, right? Since from the 1953 yes. one. Yes, we love those applied labels. They seem to be a lot clearer than some of the stamped ones. Yeah, you don't have the issue of them trying to like make sure everything's still when they go stamping it on. Yeah. Um, yeah. Another big difference that I love about these ones is the fiber content. So this one is 65% polyester, 35% cotton. Now, if anyone has ever tried to just pick up fabric and know what when it's a blend like that of what fiber it is, you'll know the difficulties. And this is something that for collections work, you really want to know when I'm going through items is what something is made out of. And it can be very challenging to actually determine what um, a fabric, a, a piece of textile is actually made of, because we usually have, um, we're limited mostly to visual inspection in order to figure that out. Hence this. So this is actually as a result of a little microscope thing that I can put on textiles to try and understand the, um, the weave and the, what the fibers are, but it is very challenging. So <laughs> when you get an actual, percentage thing and you can just write it down. Mm, so nice. And this is actually a result of the Textile Labeling Act in 1985. 1985 onward, we start seeing um, fiber content consistently on labels, which I think is a huge boon <laughs> for when you're doing this. What other kind of changes came in with that act? Um, in with that act, um, so it also includes identifying um, of the person by or for whom the consumer textile article was manufactured or made, um, and other information and representations may be required by the regulations to be included on the labels. So I have the text of some of it not written down in front of me, which is why you're going to get in the more formal um, language. Uh, but yeah, the, one of the biggest things that I find on it is the um, the generic name of each textile fiber composing a five percent or more by mass of the total fiber mass of the article of the article, and subject to regulation, such percentage mass by the total fiber mass of the article as each textile fiber named in pursuant to the subparagraph comprises. It's a very very technical document, but one of the main things is that what is the um, the fiber it is. The fun thing though, this also has is the, the cleaning instructions. It's all the little symbols across the bottom. So those are- course, we're not cleaning. Yeah, we're not, we're not washing the artifacts using those, but it is neat to know. Um, there is one that we have, which I don't have a picture of in this presentation, but it is a, um, a winter coat and it's this massive label. I'm like, oh my goodness, we're gonna get so much information. It's all cleaning instructions and wear instructions. It's massive amount of information. Put on it that way. Moving on to more tags, because I will move on from tags, I promise, but we're going to start there. And just so people know, I changed, Jessica and I have did a, a run through of this, and then I changed some of the pictures on her. So she's seeing these, some of these for the first time with you today. Um, so some of these tags actually are a lot more personal. So this is, um, this cape is fairly, um, a fairly standard cape. Um, with the outer in dark blue with the red lining. It's not, it's not got a lot of description of the individual because it doesn't have that ranking information or the other sort of insignias that you would get on uniform. But on the inside, you can sort of see it peeking through the collar here. And this is a close up of it. You can tell that it is made for a specific person and it provides a specific date, which helps take an item that could have has a, a wider range of time periods and gives it this very singular moment and individual it is connected to, which I find really, really fascinating because it gives an art, an item, um, a sort of a more of a, um, a life. You kind of know like, oh, a person wore this and this is when they started wearing it kind of feeling, which I find adds a lot to an artifact and an item. 
Um, this one specifically um, was actually made in Montreal. You see tailored by the Workman Uniform Corps Limited, Montreal. Um, I was looking into this company. It's a bit of a tricky one I'm finding to track. Um, you do see other items with the same company um, name showing up in other collections, um, particularly Second World War, I was noticing, particularly with the Canadian War Museum. Um, but you can actually start, once you know the company, you can actually start tracking them down to get sort of another aspect of the history because this company obviously does uniforms. They're gonna have that sort of military connection as we go forward. This next sample is another very personal tag as well. Um, it's on a mess jacket this time. Um, and I, it's another really interesting one because it does have that very specific name and the date. And I'd like to talk a little bit about the company. So this is interesting. So this company, Jones, Chalk and Dawson, Six Sackville Street, Piccadilly West. So this is actually made in London, which raises a whole bunch of questions for me. This is a Canadian uniform that someone has obviously sent their measurements or was in England, in London, in order to get this mess jacket. And they were a lieutenant when, it, when they did this because that is the rank given on the, on, on the label itself. And it's one of those things, when you're looking inside these uniforms, these are the things that nobody else gets to see. Like once this uniform is made, it's meant to, the exterior is what meant to be seen. So what's on the inside has sort of a different feeling to it to me. Um, so like the fact that it was made in London is not something that's readily advertised on the outside, but it is on right, the inside. Because this would have been a pattern, right? Like this is- like There's a standard to what you wear, yeah. Yeah, there would have been a standard, this is the, the cut of the time period that you would wear for a mess jacket. Um, but yeah, I was looking up this company and I looked up, I did the street view of Six Axwell Street, Piccadilly. Um, and they are not in that building anymore because from best I can tell, they've amalgamated with this Myers and Mortimer company. So there's a few companies that amalgamated together and they are located just, they just recently relocated to another location on Sackville Street. And you can, you know, when you have like businesses that have been somewhere a really long time and they had like decals in the window and you peel them off and you can still sort of see like the phantom of them. Yeah. yeah. When I was on the street, you could still sort of see it for that address <laughs> in London. Which so, was, so this was 54. This was 54. Right? And the street so, view was nice as uh, 2021. Wow. Yeah. I thought that was really. So it's interesting. Some of these companies that we're talking about in very historic terms are currently in some way functional. These guys are a little bit tricky to find because of that amalgamation, but, there's but they're this, sort of still around. There's, yeah, and there's this really long continuity. So like we think of some, sometimes we think of these things that they don't connect the same way and they actually have this really long history, which is incredible. So the next slide we're actually, I'm actually want to talk more about this uh, waistcoat, this vest underneath, because it gives that idea of like personal connection, um, another, another aspect. So as I said, it's waistcoat for the same mess dress. Um, I assume there's no tag in this one, but we, I do assume that it was made very similar, similar time period, probably the same time, I would assume. But the reason why I really, really love this is it has such clear signs of alteration and wear. So if you're looking at the, um, the right picture um, where it says the close up of the zipper, you can see where there's stitch lines removed. Um, you can see little bits of that red thread there, as well as the fabric actually discoloring into that red, which I find very interesting. I'm not 100% sure why it discolored in that way. But you can tell that this uniform was, so they had a uniform that they sent, either they were in England or they sent measurements to and got tailored to them. And then here's the vest where at some point in its usage, and this person who had been wearing it for a number of years, had to bring it in didn't fit properly. For one reason or another, this vest got brought in and possibly let out. You can still see some of the stitching, so I'm not sure if it was actively chosen to be let out or just this happened over time. But yeah, it's interesting when we're looking at uniforms because these are things that you might not get to see, but they give more depth and more expansion to the understanding of what- Literally expansion. In this case. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, actually, this one I think was actually more brought in. I'm actually curious. The one thing I can't tell you for sure, like it definitely got like, pinched and stitched, but was it let out intentionally? 
again. Right. That I'm not 100% sure on because I can still see those thread bits. Just, so it's all supposition at this point. We're just theorizing a lot, but it's still interesting to find this evidence. Um, someone has asked, would the metal zipper have been an original part of this piece? Um, it probably would have been. It does feel really heavy duty for it, but um, I was just, I actually, I don't want to mess up the slideshow, but I'm, I had opened the dress regulations from, I believe, 1960, and they do mention a zipper at that point. As we said, this is 54, which is a little bit prior, but there is that sort of, um, just afterwards, they are mentioning um, a zipper in the um, waistcoat for the mesh dress. Do you think I have it? I, it's literally open. It's just underneath the slideshow. Yeah. But from best I can tell, though, I, I do see what you're looking at, the idea of like how, how it's attached and all that. At this point, I would say it'd be hard for me to know if it was replaced at any point. But Which question. would just be another symptom of that, that wear and tear that we see. Exactly. It was used. Yeah, it was used. Yeah, that's very, very, very true. And depending, like, if you get someone who's really, really good at that type of stuff, it can be really, really hard to tell when someone swaps something. So coming back to this idea of wear and tear. So this is a first world war um, era uniform. Um, and if you're looking at the two pictures on the right, those are both the armpits and they're both discolored because that is from best we could, we would assume is sweat stains, which I know is not the most glamorous thing to be talking about, but it is this idea that this uniform was worn and had a life and had, and the guy sweat in it because they're doing their job kind of situation. And I do find this really, really interesting. The other thing is we're seeing signs of repair um, in both of the armpits. Now the top one, um, I was talking about Jessica about this one because I find this very odd. Like usually when you see an armpit being repaired, it's like a whip stitch and they just sort of tack the lining back to the coat. More of like a use yeah, thing. Like, like it's a quick, a, I need it, yeah, I need it attached again, so. Yeah. They just yeah. get it, get it done, which is perfectly good. It does the job. And that's what I see most often. This top picture is really interesting. So what's happening here is the wool's gotten very thin and um, gotten delicate. And what is the, the type of stitching I'm seeing on this is very something that I'm mostly familiar with from textile stabilization in museums. It's a stitch that's very common. So couching, coaching is what it's called. Um, it's when you take the, the horizontal, the one direction, and then little stitches going in the other way. So you'll see the long verticals with these little horizontals. And that's something that I would actually usually attribute to museums because that's where I know it from. But from our records, this has not been done here. That's not been done at the museum. So it's interesting that idea of these types of stitches have these longer, these other lives. We get used to thinking of them in a really one-dimensional, one-locational usage, but they have this much wider thing. Um, and it looks really good. It's very clean from the outside. You don't see it very much, if at all. And it's a really, really good way of stabilizing a fabric. So it's just fascinated by the work and ship of, that has been done um, throughout this uniform's life. It's also a, re a really important thing about us recording what we do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, usually if we do any sort of conservation work, it is well documented. We do photos before, after. We keep a record of exactly what we've done to it so that we don't have these questions where we look at it and we go, is this possibly conservation work that somebody's done and we just don't have a record of it? Or was this done as part of repairs in this object's life before it came to the museum? Yeah, exactly. So it's, it's just, it's really, and it's really neat work. I would have, I'd love to meet the person who did it because like, that is, it's very, very even, and I love it very much for that. So that is a World War I area. Um, another sign of wear, so these are trousers, I believe, from the 1980s. And I have to say, I believe, because they've been worn so well that the most of the words have worn off. Um, so this is just another sign of wear that takes me from a label that's going to give me lots of information to a label I can tell it's 65% wool, 35% polyester but I'm, you're starting to lose um, the information because it's been worn so much. 
The other thing is you look at the position of it here in the pants, in the trousers, in the waist. I would assume like, usually you're wearing your shirt tucked in with this type of trouser, but with, without, those would chafe so much, that tag. It would be one of those tags that's itchy and annoying to me. Yeah. So this next one is an example of a really, really important reason why we need to look inside textiles when we get them. Because sometimes on the outside, as you can tell on the left, everything looks like it's in pretty good shape. This, this um, frock coat looks pretty good. The wool's in pretty good shape. As soon as we open it, you see what's on the left. Now this frock coat's 100, over 100 years old. It's not that surprising that there is deterioration on the inside, but it really changes how we think about handling it. Like you always want to be careful with artifacts and all of that, and we don't want to cause them any additional um, stress. But without knowing what state it was in, we might not know exactly where it needs support. So you really do want to look inside because that is often going to give you the best um, sense of what's going on inside an artifact. It's it's a pretty neat one though, but yeah, you can tell it's. It was a quite a surprise. I don't know if I showed you this one when we first were looking at it, Jessica, but. Yeah, um, that that white spot kind oh, of yeah. down the, the back. Is, yeah. that a, is that like the background? That's the tear? That's, yeah, that's an actually, we're seeing yeah. through it right there. So yeah, yeah it's, it's seen better days, but. Yeah, we're gonna from actually the come, outside, looks great. <laughs> yeah, it looks great from the outside. It looks really, really great, so. Um, we're actually going to come back to this one to talk about some of that, some of the other stuff inside. But yeah, it's it's a big reason why we have to look inside very early on because it'll you'll repair things so the outside looks good, but the inside because you're the only one seeing it. Sometimes they don't see the same level of uh, repair levels. Um, so this one I want to show you just for a quick second. Um, this is an East German uniform, and it is also stamped with information. And I just wanted to remind that this we're talking a lot about Canadian Army uniforms here because that's what we deal with dominantly. But this practice of putting information inside the uniform, is, is, you see it in many other places. So this is a East German one. I was working on a Soviet uniform recently. And though I can't read Russian, it does have the, um, the stamping with information as well. So that's quite an interesting fact. Now, Jessica knows why I have this one up. Yes. Um, it's because I think it's pretty. <laughs> um, so this is a 1954 summer dress. And I just wanted to draw attention to this because these uniforms are made to look good on the outside. They really are. You're looking, you look, a lot of them you look real sharp in. Inside this one, someone put a lot of time and a lot of effort to bind all of these seams in that lining fabric. This is not technically necessary. There are other ways, less labor intensive ways to clean up an edge or to keep things from fray, or you could just not if you're not worried about it. But they picked um, such a decorative way of doing it. And it looks so pretty, it looks so nice. And it just, I wonder what it feels, it would have been feel like to wear that particular uniform to be like, to know that you have that level of workmanship on the inside. So a lot of what we're doing when I'm looking at these things is we're trying to get these practical details because Jessica needs it for the database and to put all the practical information in. But I spend a lot of time trying to think about the people who were wearing them and what that felt like. And I find like the info on the inside um, tells us a little bit more. We also have um, a comment regarding the uh, previous Jack that we were looking at with the um, repair work. Mm, yes. Um, someone has said that it looks more like a darning repair rather than overlaid couching, couching. Okay, I'm gonna note that. Cool. It just, it's, that's what it looked like to me is it can immediately made me think of this textile museum thing. So I'll have to look into that darning, darning stitching. That'd be great. Um, so the one of the ma last major concepts I want to talk to you guys is about construction. Because when we're inside a garment, I, I always find that I have a better sense of how it was made than I do looking sometimes from the outside. Um, so this is a 1947 patterned battle dress blouse. And the reason why I'm showing it to you is 
this one has a stamp in it. I know what date it was made. But if I didn't have that information, these battle dress blouses, there's a number of different patterns that have been used. And one of the ways to sort out one from another is where their seam lines are. So this one has seam lines under the arm, which is different than some of the other styles. So by knowing that, I can actually help identify the item. Um, and if people are looking for more um, information about identifying them, it's again, remind me at the end, I have a source that I find very useful for that. So this is a little bit about the construction and like the idea that it's only lined on three of the buttonholes, not the top one. And that raises questions to me as in why. What about how you wear it makes that the, the appropriate way of uh, lining, the jet, lining the item, which is really, really fascinating. Um, I'm gonna go, I'm attempting to go backwards a few slides to this one. Ha, I'm feeling very technically savvy right now because I managed to do that. So as I was saying, these uniforms are made, they're, they're designed to look good. Like you're supposed to, like in the frock coat, you're supposed to look good. In your, in your nice dress uniform, you're supposed to look good um, while wearing them. And I find the uniforms themselves are helping, they're working to help make that effective. So what we're seeing the damage in here is all of the layers that would have been going over the front of the coat, which would have created a nice smooth surface and a look. Um, and because of the damage on this one, no, it's not good that it's damaged. And I really wish it was in better shape, but hundred plus years. But because of it, we can see the layering. And this gives us further information about how the item is constructed. So by having all of these layers, we can see how it's made. So this is also giving us more information about what was going on and how things were being made at the time. Um, the East German uniform is another really good example of this. Um, we are not, I'm not gonna take the lining out to see how it's constructed, but I am very curious because this thing is very structural. Um, this mannequin that it's on has no arms. <laughs> you can't tell because it is so, the wool and the materials they're using and the way they did it, it's a very, very stiff uniform to the point that it does make it hard to get on and off mannequins. It is actually a challenge. They did that. So when you put that uniform on, it's going to help carry you in a specific way, which further contributes to the look, which I find. Um, very, very fascinating. Um, how they build uniforms to make a particular way. So those are the main ideas that I look for when I'm looking inside a uniform. I'm looking for tags. I'm looking for where. I'm looking for how it was made and any structural or uh, damage concerns about how we handle them in order to take the best care that we can of these different artifacts. All right, so we're, this is going to wrap up sort of the formal um, the part of this uh, presentation. I'm really glad you guys were all able to join us. Um, I hope you learned something. Please follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can also check out our YouTube channel. Um, we hope to do more presentations similar to this, so you will find out there um, for our, our next one, um, and hopefully we'll see you again another time. Thank you guys very much, and have a great day.